All right, so Rachel, welcome to Money Talks the podcast, hosted by Becoming Financially Fit. Uh, thanks for being on the show. My pleasure. Excited to be here. Um, so yeah, so Money Talks is about personal finance, financial literacy, literacy, savings, investing, and also entrepreneurship. So definitely wanted to have you, have you on the show. We met through a mutual friend um, from Ohio, correct? Yeah, I'm from Toledo, Ohio, and um, I'm friends with Jannard, who we went to high school together, um, and that's how I met you. Yeah. So yeah. Um, and you're also an artist. So um, just to kick it off, I'll give you maybe, you know, a couple minutes just to talk about yourself, talk about your upbringing, and then we can get into everything. OK, cool. So um, I am an artist and a graphic designer and I work in the Diamond District right now. Um, and I have a few freelance clients as well. So on a day to day basis, I'm a graphic designer um, and I'm an artist for myself. Uh, and so I grew up in Toledo. I spent a lot of my childhood and high school years focused completely on volleyball. I was an athlete. I was like set to be an athlete, this, that, the fourth. Um, that was it for me. And I spent all my time focusing on how to get into college through volleyball. I got to, I got a scholarship to a really small school in Long Island. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and it was a division two school and we were pretty good and everything was great and nice and small private, private college. So um, the money handling of that college was really poor for like 40 years. Mm -hmm. And so between my sophomore and junior years of college, the school shut down. So the university, just the entire school just shut down. So I was on a team. I had my teammates. I was like on track to be a captain. Um, everything was like fine and dandy. And then the school shut down. I got, I think it was like two weeks into summer. And Damn. the school was just like, sorry, we're closed. So uh, I didn't have any schools to go to. Every college roster was full by that I point. Bet, yeah. You know what I mean? It's midsummer. Uh, um, all my teammates were in trouble too. Like we didn't know where to go. So um, I just decided, okay, I can explore like some Division One schools and be like a walk on and not have any chance of seeing the court ever again. Uh, or go to a D2 school, get no money. Like basically my options were squashed. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I'm just going to pursue art. Now is the time I've always had like a love for art, but I, I denied that as part of my identity for a long time. Um, you know, throughout high school and my first few, few years of college where I just did it as a hobby. And yeah. then, you know, this opportunity came along where I was kind of scrambling to find a place to go to. And I thought, okay, I want to stay in New York. You know, I've, I've been on Long Island. Uh, it's not so different from Ohio. I want to be in New York City. And so I ended up talking to the Pratt coach because Pratt has a volleyball team. And mm -hmm. he... The Pratt Institute. Yeah, the Pratt yeah. Institute, which is uh, where I ended up going. He, uh, knew, he knew my college coach from the school that had closed. He knew of him. And he figured, all right, well let's just get this girl on the team because they're an AIA school. Mm -hmm. And I had two years of division two experience, um, division two playing. So he helped me get into Pratt at the last minute, which was a godsend. And so I ended up just being an art student from there. And wow. yeah. So, so, <laughs> so <clears throat> you go from being a college athlete yeah. um, to doing art on the side. It's kind of like a side hustle, side passion th type thing. You went to, what was the university in Long Island? It was called Dowling College. Dowling College? Yeah. Then they just closed. Shut down. Did you have a scholarship there? I had like or a partial. Par I had a partial scholarship. So, you know, and it was, uh, I was studying marketing and business and I had like a visual arts minor. So I wasn't taking art seriously at no. all at that point. And I was like, cool. Like my, my goal was basically to play in college, you know, like that had been yeah. hammered into my brain that this As is As an athlete, what that's your I'm main goal. Do. Like you want to go from high school, you want to go to college, you want to get that scholarly. And yeah. You don't think about life after your sport either. Exactly. And so it kind of slammed me in the face when my school closed because I was like, wow, I can't depend on volleyball anymore. And to get me, you know, help financially or whatever. So mm -hmm. let's double down <laughs> and let's... Um, <laughs> And let's just like go to art school mm -hmm. and, you know, take a leap of faith. And it ended up being, I mean, there's like a common theme in my life where I feel like things just work out for me. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. It's, it's absolute chaos sometimes, but it ends up working out as long as I stay true to myself. Right. So 
I ended up being true to myself and pursuing art, which is what I really loved. And um, just, it worked out really well. So I played at, I played for one year at the Pratt Institute um, and it was fun and it was cool and it was nice to still be on a team. Mm -hmm. Um, but it wasn't ultimately the best use of my time. So I, and I had to work, I had to pay for myself to be in art school. So, uh, I had to, you know, not play the second year I was there, but, um, you know, I'm in an adult league now, but anyways, uh, (laughs) (laughs) but yeah, so I ended up at Pratt and that was that. Okay. And so at Pratt, you said primarily in art school. Mm-hmm. Um, and did you finish Pratt or? Yeah, I got my associate's degree. I, w- I okay. was on track because because I had gotten into the school so late, they didn't have room in the regular program. Mm-hmm. So I had to join the associate's program and all the courses were in on the Manhattan campus. Yeah. And so I lived in Brooklyn and commuted, and commuted to Manhattan to get my associate's degree. And that was super cool. I loved that. Yeah. Um, and then I attempted to go and continue my degree and get uh, my undergraduate, which would be the the track is like you, you get your two years and if you want to continue the rest of your courses for the next two years or whatever years you have left yeah. on Brooklyn campus. So I went to classes on the Brooklyn campus for a semester and then I just I couldn't do, do it because I was working full time and I was like, I really want, you know, my undergrad, but I, I don't have time to care about any of my school projects when I actually have to like, when I'm actually working for people, I'm actually a graphic designer right now and I can't justify spending time on homework when I'm not getting paid with homework. You know exactly. what I mean? It, it's hard to balance out, especially if you don't have like that financial backing, like that you don't have to worry about anything. It's just like everything's paid for, but right. you were working through college. Um, and so you said you're a graphic designer. So when you were doing that, who were some of like your first clients? My first clients, well, right when I... Uh, started going to Pratt, I saw that Greg needed, and this is Greg Yuna. Mm-hmm. Um, he's my boss currently, and he's my creative partner currently. But um, back then, I was just following him. My brother was following him. He's a celebrity jeweler, and he makes he's super creative. So we were just following him for um, the spectacle of it all, and just as admirers of jewelry. Not that we were shopping for it or anything, but. Yeah. He was a cool follow, so he put on his story that he needed um, a graphic designer or an assistant role filled. So my brother was like, "You just you have to go. Like you need to just pull up, just show him whatever you have, see what happens." And I was like, you know, I didn't have any confidence as an artist at that point. I had a really weak, sad little like eight page portfolio of just like random things that I had done, and I was like, "All right, whatever. I'm just gonna take another leap of faith." I'm just going to pull up and see what's going on, see if he likes my work. So I, I scrolled through my portfolio on my laptop and um, and then I got hired on the spot. On he the just, spot. He just hired me on the spot. So he had... Um, yeah, talk talk about that. I want to know like how that process went. Like so I, I imagine you're probably nervous when you pulled up. I looked up. crazy. He'll <laughs> tell you this like every single time. He tells everyone I pulled up looking crazy. I like, I was so young. I was, you know, 20 maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I must've been 20 because it was about, it was over four years ago. I was 20. I pulled up, um, I had like a fur coat on. I looked ridiculous. I was wearing like a white turtleneck and like some, (laughs) some pre-owned Rick, Rick Owens boots, which I thought were super fleet, but I, (laughs) I looked crazy. And, um, I walked up to their booth. They have a booth on sixth Avenue. Mm -hmm. And I just walked in, I DM'd him before I came and I was like, Hey, I heard you need an assistant. Let me introduce myself, whatever. Uh, and then I did. I pulled up. I was shaking. I was nervous, all this stuff. And uh, he had a shoot. He does like these things called Sixth Avenue shoots mm-hmm. where he'll go on Sixth Ave, stop traffic, take a photo. And he had a shoot with Raekwon the next day. Wow. So he was like, I need a shirt made. I need you to design a shirt for me right now for the shoot. ASAP. So I did that for him on the spot where I had to like manipulate the Wu-Tang logo. Mm-hmm. So I was like, cool, let me just do that for you right now. And he was like, I also need an invoice template. Can you make me one of those? And I was like, sure, I guess. Googled how to make an invoice template. <laughs> and um, and then he was like, all right, cool. So you can come back tomorrow and we'll see what's going on. And that was that was it. Damn. And how long ago was that? Four and a half years ago. It was winter, winter of, it must have been 2016. Damn. So four ish years ago, um, but yeah. Ever since then, um, I've been I've been his assistant, and and then I've just 
sort of grown over the past half a year into being his creative partner. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Man, going from just a random story to becoming the creative partner and being the assistant of Greg Yuna, who, like you said, is a famous jeweler. He's been in movies recently. Yeah, he was in that. That's, that's pretty great. That's, a, you know, an accomplishment in itself. Life is nuts. But like I said, um, things just work out when you just are, I don't know, for me, at least I can say uh, <laughs> things are working out for me and it doesn't make sense, but yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. And, and stuff like that just happens. So, um, you know, I feel really blessed, really grateful to be with him still. And, mm -hmm. you know. That's that's that. So then, so Greg was so getting back to your question. Greg was m one of my first clients. Okay, uh, which is crazy. And then, <laughs> and then he had yeah, which yeah, he took he took a, le a leap of faith on me too, mm -hmm. uh, and that that still means a lot to me to this day. So he was one of my first clients, and then I think I had a few gigs here and there, just random doing like graphic design work that didn't mean it like it was like resizing photos yeah. for like textbook companies or something like that like nothing cool not design work at all it was just like do you have a it was basically the criteria was do you have a general understanding of graphic design cool like it was just like an hourly gig um i nannied for a family uh in the summers and during the school year it was just like whatever short-term freelance gigs I could get. So mm -hmm. there was probably a handful of them. And then um, we, uh, Greg shifted his store. So he had to move away from his location, get a new booth, uh, basically restart his business, rebrand everything. So I took like half a year off working with him. Okay. And during that time, I interned at uh, an app startup called The Wave. All right, so intern at an app startup. Yeah, I was an intern at an app startup called The Wave, W-E-I-V, and it's sort of a, a platform for sharing like exclusive content for uh, basically influencers. So I was there for a while, and that was, you know, I was their that was their only graphic designer at the time, and mm -hmm. it was a it was a big workload, and I couldn't keep up with it. Uh, as a student and I just felt like I was like drowning in all this work and, and school work and my grades were not great. So uh, Greg started needing my help again when he had settled into his new place at that time. So I had a uh, new place in Diamond. Yeah, he got a okay. new booth uh, around the corner mm -hmm. in a newer building. And so I shifted from I, I ended my internship at The Wave and I moved over to work with Greg again. And then through that internship, uh, one of the co-founders, she had been doing PR for a uh, fine artist. Wow. And she had connected us because as I, I was supposed to be a fill-in graphic designer for this fine artist. And it turns out I'm still working for her too to this day. So uh, I work for, and her name is Elizabeth Sutton, the okay. fine artist. Yeah. Uh, and Liz does home decor, clutch design. She, we designed like a leather um, apparel line together she does uh she does paintings and all this other stuff she does wallpaper she does everything under the sun so you know i was supposed to be a fill-in for uh, for her graphic designer who had just left but it turned out i had left wave i had a little more free time and i was with greg so i decided to stick with liz mm -hmm. and now i'm her lead graphic designer as well so That's pretty dope. so now i'm i'm currently split between Greg and Liz are my main clients. Mm -hmm. And then from Liz, I've, there, there have also been a few um, clients that branched off from her as well. Okay. So what, that's pretty crazy. You kind of started out with Greg Yuna. Greg went, is, went to Liz. Yeah. And so now you're pretty much a graphic designer. Like you have your own book. You have, I know, like you I post trade. a lot of stuff, like a lot of your dope picture. You actually just showed me one that you just finished, which was pretty cool. Thank you. So now talking about the money aspect. When you start out, I can imagine like that conversation is probably awkward to have like, hey, like how much am I going to get paid? Do I have benefits? So explain, you know, how that process works for someone who doesn't know or maybe wants to be a graphic designer. Being a freelancer is tricky because I started out as a freelancer, but I didn't know that I was a freelancer. I thought I was going to get a set position because I don't know how the world works, right? Yeah. I thought I was going to get a set position. I was going to, you know, I thought maybe hourly and, you know, an hourly rate benefits. I don't know. I had no <laughs> idea what, what was going to happen for me. 
but of course not. I was I was only working part time with Greg because I was in school all the time, um, and you know freelancing. I just I didn't do my research on that, mm-hmm. and so I w- I found myself scraping to get by, getting paid crumbs yeah. by, and justifiably so by a lot of people because I didn't have a degree and I don't know how to talk about money. So it it is it was what it was, and um, I would like to preface this by saying talking about money is extremely stressful for me and not something I'm comfortable with. I don't know why I have such aversion to it, mm-hmm. but it's there, right? Yeah. So it's there for a lot of people, surprisingly. I mean, I, well, I mean, I surprisingly for that. me, I'm in finance, so I'm like I have to talk about it every day. It's something I kind of like grew up on, like just being in, interested in. But I know a lot of people like when the topic of money comes up or something like that, they kind of just like tense up. I yeah. don't know what it is. And I feel like it probably has something to do with the fact that my parents never talked about money. Really? Like as a little kid, yeah. I remember being a kid and, be, and wanting to know just out of curiosity how much money my parents made, which obviously like is kind of an inappropriate question. I don't think it is. I, now I don't think it is. Yeah. But my parents, my parents were right for not telling me because I would have just went and blabbed to all my friends. Oh, my <laughs> whatever. Uh, but that's not, you know, I, I feel like that kind of stuck with me where it was just like, don't, don't talk about that. Don't, don't worry about it. It's not your business kind of thing. So, you know, I'm not comfortable talking about money to this day. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's part of why I'm, I was nervous when I came here because I was like, I don't want to face, but I know I have to face this. I didn't want to face it though, because it's not something that I am confident with yeah. or I'm skilled in. So, mm-hmm. you know, um, that led to me, you know, scraping to get by as a student and not asking for a fair pay. What and, you're worth. You know, and, and, you know, no matter how good I was, you know, some people still are, you know, I, I wasn't, maybe I wasn't the right fit or maybe I just had different, a different eye than them or whatever. But, you know, I, I found it hard to validate a certain price and things like, you know, can you cover my commute? Can you cover my lunch? three days a week or something like that. Like I, I didn't have the negotiation skills to do that. And I still don't, Mm -hmm. if I'm being honest. So, you know, it was a struggle. Our school was hard and that's ultimately why I dropped out because I couldn't afford to do it anymore. I I wasn't making enough money at all and I wanted to work, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I would say, (laughs) so (laughs) I don't know if, no, 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 no. That's interesting because, um, I know a lot of people get into freelancer or they think it's cool because not only they can follow their passion, what you're doing, but then it's like, you can set your own rate. But from your point of view, you think about it as, you know, you're still kind of coming up in the game and you might not be able to ask for some of those certain things. And that's something, uh, you know, the cameraman Navir goes through as well. Like he's, you know, 18, he's going through the whole process of, okay, what should I be charging? What's my worth? What is someone willing to pay? And it's hard. Honestly, like I, I know when we first started having some conversations, like, you know, it was those, discussions where you kind of just have to say hey you know this is my price I'm gonna stick to it um but like you said it's not normal and it's not a lot uh it's not talked about as much um but I'm trying to change that with you know what I'm doing which is why I appreciate this right it's giving me like it's a psychological thing I think where I'm able to just sit down literally in front of a camera and have it be recorded and say this is something I'm not good at I'm I, there is some shame rooted in that, not mm-hmm. being good with money. Um, but I need to get better at it. I need yeah. to, you know, approach it and become comfortable with it by my own standards. Right? Exactly. Especially for you as an artist, because you do some dope stuff. Like I've seen it in like some of your huge like paintings. Like I think we went to an art show that Joe or Greg was hosting. Yeah. Did and you? yeah. Uh, over in Queens. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah it was. It was so like those. And, and I saw um, I was kind of just going through the whole gallery and some of those art pieces were 40,000, 50,000. And I didn't even have my name tag on my pieces because I'm, that's, uh, <laughs> I didn't have a price on those pieces. I didn't paint those for, to sell. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? I painted those for myself and Greg was like, cool, throw your art up there too, which is like fire. But yeah, then you see artists next to mine, like uh, Sue, Sue Sai. Yeah. She's a phenomenal artist. She has really expensive pieces. She has amazing collaborations with all these deals. And I I look at that and I think I want, I would like to be on a trajectory like that, Mm -hmm. but I need somebody to manage that for me. And I need somebody to talk numbers and I need somebody to have the ugly conversations for me. And I want a manager to take X amount percent. So I don't have to deal with that. 
Exactly. Because I'm not and, comfortable with it. Yeah. And, and so I think there's two ways of going about going about the whole money conversation. Um, and that's either doing it yourself, you know, being, you know, just setting your price and saying, OK, here's what I want. Here's what I need. If you, you can meet it or you can't. And, you know, that's it. There are other people who then go about by either hiring finance managers, accountants, lawyers and things like that to have those conversations. And I think there's some good and bad to both. Obviously, like if you're doing it yourself, you have full control and nobody can take, you know, any slice of the pie. Um, but like you said, some people aren't comfortable having those conversations. If you go with the manager or the accountant or something like that, then they can actually help you out. They have more experience. But then that comes with you having to give them a pretty much a percentage of everything. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, you know, I'm not in a place yet where I could even, I'm not in a place where I'm going to have a manager anytime soon. Yeah. Right. I, I'll give myself a timeline. That's a goal I'm going to have. Mm. But, you know, I mean, it, it's different when, if, if I went a corporate route and I went to work, I feel like if I went to work for a design firm where they have an HR department and a payroll department and I have a clear boss that is just my boss, that's the only role then it's cool. Then I would be like, all right, yeah, let's talk let's talk numbers because it's just business. Yeah. Another issue that makes money way harder for me is that I have very uniquely personal relationships with everyone I work for. Mm -hmm. You have to separate the money versus it's, the business versus, you know, actually just being, hey, this person is my friend or my mentor. Like, how do we have that discussion? Right. How do you have the discussion? I... <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't. If I'm being honest, I let them approach it. And um, I also just have aversion to, to conflict. I can't handle conflict. So I, so that to me, negotiation mm -hmm. feels like conflict when it's because it's also something that's very personal to me. My artwork and my graphic design is personal to me in it. And, you know, my ego will get bruised and all these other things. So I let them bring up the conversation and Thankfully, I work for people that respect me and, mm. you know, see a lot in me and and do pay me what I'm worth at this point. Yeah. Um, but that hasn't always been the case. And when it hasn't been the case, I remove myself from the situation. What's good you do that? Can you talk about one of those experiences Is where like no? you kind of. <laughs> Is I mean, it good? I, like, mean, I, I feel like I'd rather be doing stuff that I, I love, even if I'm, you know, not getting paid as much rather sure. than someone, you know, getting my, a piece of my work or commissioning me. But then they're just kind of trying to lowball me or under, you know, undercut, you know, the actual price or, or what should be going for. It. Right. I mean, I don't know. What do you think, though? Because I've had places where it's like, OK, they're a business owner yeah. and that is not on a on a logical level. I understand that that is not them trying to insult me or diminish my work or make me feel like I'm less. But um, <laughs> and I respect them for that. And, you know, I don't I don't think all opportunities are just monetary. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if I stay working with exactly. somebody exactly. that is going to give me more than money. I mean, connections are way more valuable than money to me. Absolutely. At this point, like what, another ten dollars an hour? I don't need that. I would rather be in the same room as X, Y, Z and make you that know. connection. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, which is what I'm getting right now with both the people that I, you know, Liz and Greg, mm -hmm. you know, they're they're doing that for me. So I don't know. I feel like there have been situations in which um, I, I felt guilty for not toughing it out and not sitting there and getting paid scraps. Yeah. Because I have like this weird, it's a weird mental thing, you know? I mean, I don't, I don't think it's mental. I, I think everyone should be paid what they're worth. But then at the same time. In an ideal world. Right? But, then at, but then at the same time, if they're willing to accept less, I then can't feel bad for them. So you were talking about from the perspective of a business owner. If I commission an artist mm -hmm. and I say, hey, I need a piece of work for my restaurant or my office space, I'm willing to pay you $500. But you know in your heart for a fact that everything you make minimum $5,000. Right. Would you accept it? For you? Yeah. Yeah, because you're a homie. Because you're yeah. my friend. Yeah. Right? And um, that goes way further like, like, which sometimes can be to my detriment and I'm aware of that, yeah. but I am way more willing, like I'm way more willing to do nice things for people that I care about and mm -hmm. that I know, uh, even if it means, you know, I, I take a loss or not a loss, but, or I'm not getting my regular, mm -hmm. right. Which, you do know, you, do you think that people take advantage of you before, because of that? 
I don't think my, f I, I think I let people think that it's not a big deal. I think I let people think that it's not because I'm just a people pleaser. Yeah. I think I let people feel like, okay, it's cool. Just it's it's nothing off my back. I can I can do this gigantic painting for you for three hundred dollars, whatever. I wouldn't do that for a non friend though. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, where do you draw that line? That, that's where you have to find, right? It's tough, and and that is also something that I need to work work around. But, um, you know, yeah, I mean these things play a big role. And then, but then, you know, if you're putting my work hypothetically in 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 a restaurant and I get to have my name on it. Okay, like that. That the pros and again cons. Yeah. is is not just a monetary value. That's a that's connections. That's name recognition. Uh, that's people taking pictures in front of it. Whatever you know, that kind of thing. So I don't so, know. So what's your end goal? Ultimately, ultimately, I want to. <sighs> it's a really good question. I, I genuinely don't know. Really? I'm in I'm in a point in my life where I'm reassessing everything, mm -hmm. uh, and COVID has had a lot to do with that. Definitely, I think COVID's hit everyone hard. Certainly, certainly. I mean, I I feel like right now I'm at the beginning of like my true art career, mm -hmm. where I'm making art that I'm having so much fun with, and I love, and I'm I'm working too super super hefty jobs that are graphic design which is basically in my eyes like a service job yeah and then my role at greg is sort of a dual role where i'm his creative partner but i'm still an assistant i'm still hand handling you know invoices and all these other things um so right now i have like the survival money mm -hmm. right there it's ready and yep. i'm cool and i'm and i'm working and it it's that's handled. So now I'm in a position where I can actually assess my, my goals. Mm -hmm. And I feel like ultimately I want to just be in people's homes. That's all I want at this point. How so? I don't know if that means I get a print in everybody's home that likes my art. I don't know if that means I make things more accessible, less accessible. Uh, I don't know, you know if that means I get collaborations mm -hmm. with gigantic brands. I don't know if you know, I don't know if I can get my name in everyone's. I don't know. Like I, I think that that is a start of a goal for me. Yeah. To to get out there. Okay. And as an artist, you said you have some survival money set aside. How do you plan out like your monthly expenses on a month to month basis when you can't really depend on like a a check or a salary coming every two weeks or every month? Here's the thing, Greg is it, i mean the i have two two flows of income yeah right so it's greg and it's liz they vary based on whether or not you know greg and i are out of the office that week or whatever uh with liz it's i work for her at an hourly rate mm -hmm. i i have such trouble with money i don't even think about it really i just wing it it's another example of me it doesn't make sense but it just works out to where i can end up paying my rent mm -hmm. right um and I'm lucky for that. Yeah. Right. Don't get me wrong. I, I go to work for Greg every morning and then until 5 p.m. And then I go to Liz's apartment and work with her until sometimes one in the morning. So I'm working for this money, but I don't <laughs> I don't set aside like, oh, I need to make X amount this month in order to do this, that and the fourth. Yeah. I don't do any of that. I don't you, have a budget, if I'm being honest. And I know that sounds crazy. I know a that's, lot of people don't. A lot of people lot of frown people, on that. Yeah. And no, a lot of people that I've talked to that have been on this show don't have a budget. They don't track their finances. They just know like, hey, my rent might be you know seventeen hundred. I know that at the on better the thirtieth, better to have it somehow, some way. Like every time th throughout the month, like it doesn't matter what I do as long as I have that money. But I I think it would be advantageous for you to kind of just sit down maybe. And think about it for a second and be like, okay, now I want to plan for the future. You make it sound so nice. <laughs> That's <laughs> you do, and and I know it's not really that scary. I know it's not. Yeah. I have to just do it, right? Yeah. Sit down, plan out, you know, um, let me make this, let me set aside. I have loans, I have student loans that are repulsive. Like it's I, that's another thing. I don't like to think about it. I just, I do auto pay. I say, whatever, just take whatever you want every month. I don't, yeah. I don't want to even look at the number. I don't even want to You could probably know. save so much money if you just, you know, just sat down and. I know. 
It, it, it's crazy, um, and I think you're a representative of a lot of people here in the U.S. because a lot of people just, they might have some outstanding student loans, they might have rent that they're doing, they might have either a steady income or not-so-steady income, but they don't really take a chance to, to look at it in depth and say, you know what, I have some goals that I want to do, and if I just maybe take 30 minutes a month or 30 minutes a week to kind of look at my finances, that would help me out so much. And I know it's that. I know it's that easy to just just carve out time yeah. for these things. That's, you know, and I face the consequences. Uh, had I been more decisive about, you know, where I put my money over the past few years and budgeting, I wouldn't be in a position where I wish I had more savings, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, um, and when I was in school, it was, it was every month. It was, oh my God, am I gonna make rent? What am I going to do? Yeah. I'm losing my mind. Now it's not so much, right? Um, because, you know, life just changes. You, I've solidified these roles with these two people that I really care about and they've let me grow with their companies. Um, but, you know, uh, I want some financial comfort too, yeah. right? And I, that comes down to me. Yeah, I know I, that. And I was going to ask, what does financial comfort mean for you? It means like I got two months of rent put aside. It yeah. means I got um, student loans covered. It means... Um, you know, I can afford to send my mom a nice Mother's Day gift. It yeah. means, you know, I can take an Uber more often and not be like, oh, God, I, eh, this is going to be tight this month. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's that's comfort to me at this point in my life. So what happens when you get to that? Well, here's the thing. I, I'm a person that can, I like to live in like some element of chaos and that is usually financial chaos, right? Where I'm just not sure about where I'm at. I overspend, I live outside my means. I don't know why I do that. It's just the way I've been operating my entire life or, and especially in New York, mm -hmm. right? Um, I mean, I, I feel like if you live in New York, like you're always on the, on the edge. Yeah, kind of. And that's a choice I made and I own that, right? Yeah. Like, and I own going to a private art school and I own, you know, all these choices that I made, it does fall on me. And, you know, it is what it is. I have no regrets about that. But, um, but yeah, when I do get to the point of financial comfort, I'm going to want more financial comfort yeah. for when I level up my life and when I, you know, hopefully, you know, start getting my name out there and start becoming bigger and bigger and, and all that stuff. I'm going to want more. I'm yeah. going to want to be able to buy my parents a nice car for when they retire. Like that, those are my end goals right now, um, which are obviously subject to change. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean... I'm a person that's never going to be satisfied with their... I, th I think that, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the same way. to that chaos. Anytime you element. hit something, like, it, it's cool, like, you hit a goal, but then it's always like, okay, what's next? You know, what's yeah. next, what's next? And I think that's something that's always just, you know, driven me to, to get to where I am right now, but yeah. I never want to stop. There's been places where I'm like, man, if I can only just, if I can get this job, I'll be set. And you get the job, it's like, man, if I can only, like, you know, start investing and, and save up, like, five grand, I'll be set. Then you hit that, and I feel like it's a never-ending journey with money. But I think it should be like that. Yeah. Do you think that there's any negative part about that in terms not, of finances? Uh, not I at don't. All. Not at all. But I, I think there does come a point where it's like, what's more important, my time or money? But that's yeah. Your your version of of that like drive is way different than my version of that drive because yours you have a plan. Mm -hmm. And and you are a it's thought. not perfect. It's not perfect. Yeah, I, I'm but you take the time to put thought into it, right? Yeah. I refuse to do so for what, like it's like pulling teeth. Mm -hmm. Am I going to hopefully that that comes down to my choice? But but <laughs> you know I, I think that that's a positive thing in in your case. I think it's not helping my case. But at least you know it. At, le at least you're aware. <laughs> I'm self aware, <laughs> but I am also self destructive and. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be, but I'll tolerate it. Yeah. That's, that's really what it is. Like I'll tolerate this. And the funny thing is my parents were really good with money. Really? Super good with money. What do your parents do? My dad works at a, um, a company called Container Graphics. He is like a, a salesperson essentially, and they make special tools for like machinery. Okay. He never went to college. He has had the same job for 30 years. I mean, he's grown That's within crazy. the company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been at the company and he's had the same position for 30 years. And he was a fiscally responsible man. Mm -hmm. right? My mom 
I think she got some degree. She was a nurse. Yeah. She was a nurse. And then she just recently went back to school the past two years mm -hmm. and got a higher degree. And um, she works mm -hmm. in like analytics at University of Michigan for, at really? the hospital. So, okay. so she works in um, the medical field and, you know, she she bossed up. She did her thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, m my parents were really smart about money. They had their 401k set up. They, you know, they spent their money wisely. We never had a new car. We never, you know what I mean? Yep. Like, and, and they were just real with what we had, you know, middle class, right? Yeah, and middle class Ohio. It is what it is. It is what it is. And I always thought that we were like, I, I always thought that we were, I was like the poorest of my friends in terms of things, but ultimately I had a very charmed upbringing because mm -hmm. my parents were smart and they worked really hard. Um, and they put money away. And then when it came, and when it came time for college, you know, it was, it was obvious that I needed to do some of the heavy lifting on that and get a scholarship. Yep. And, you know, my parents weren't able to help me with the college thing. Um, but I mean, I don't, you know, I made those choices, right? Yeah, I made exactly. choices to go to college. Exactly. And, you know, they, they did everything for me to get me to college. So, you know, that was that. But I feel like that's why I have so much shame and like, I don't like talking about it. It makes me uncomfortable because I feel like sort of like a failure like that. You really? know what I mean? Because my parents were so good with money and then I'm just not. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I have them to compare myself to and I'm like, oh man. Really? Oh, what about, um, I don't think you're a failure. If you, I mean, because, because here's the thing, you can always get better at it. You're right. You know? You're right about that. I, it's a, it's a never ending game. You're right. And I'm going to be dealing with finances for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I don't, I think failure is the incorrect word. I feel like I am not doing my best and I'm consciously not doing my best because I'm uncomfortable about it. Ah, okay. That makes sense. But, but you're right. It doesn't mean it can't be improved. Exactly. Over time. Yeah. You know, I gotta have a serious talk with myself, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right. So getting back into it, I, um, I do want to ask you a question. Um, how how is it being um i don't want this to sound like sexist or anything how is it being a woman in the diamond district that's not sexist um no it's it's interesting because the diamond district is its own little culture mm -hmm. where um it is a lot of older men that do their own thing but because i'm with greg i feel like he looks out for me in a way where mm -hmm. it it's it's a non-issue yeah for the most part and to be honest with you, I, I don't do the dealings. I don't do the, I'm not on the ground floor dealing stones, running stuff up to our diamond setter, yeah. running stuff to our gold caster, any of that. I'm up in the office designing for clients. I'm up in the office um, designing collaborations with Greg for Greg. So, you know, I don't even really have much interaction with anybody outside of our immediate team oh really yeah so okay. it's it's pretty sweet for me um yeah. but i will say you know uh i wear a baggy t-shirt and shorts every day because <laughs> you know what i mean it's just yeah. it's just easier mm -hmm. and you know it's just one less thing to worry about yeah. and you know i mean we we just i don't know we keep it we keep it light mm -hmm. you know i think i think that greg has garnered a lot of respect uh, in the Diamond District over the last few years, and and Definitely. and if people see see me, they know that I'm with him. Um, and so you know, it's I mean, it's a small every, community. I feel like, it, yeah, it's and it's really weird. It's very like impenetrable. Yeah, and you don't. Um, I learn something new about the process and everything. Like every new every day, I yeah. learn something new about watches every day and stuff like that. So, you know, as but to answer your question, I mean, working for Greg. I've never been disrespected working for him. I've never Still, been, yeah. you know, never felt anything like that, mm -hmm. you know? All right. So now we talked about that. So going forward, I want to ask this question. Do you invest no. or have you ever thought about investing? No, it's another thing where I'm just like, mm. it just makes my stomach feel. Really? Like, I don't know. Yeah. It's like, do you like know about invest? Like besides I, like stocks, bonds, things like that. Like, I don't know anything about that. Absolutely and I don't believe my parents ever invested in anything. And I don't believe, and I have always been under the impression, which I have a feeling is incorrect, but I've always been under the impression that, you know, you have to have some disposable income to put away and invest in order to invest, you know, at 
Not necessarily. Doing something that is efficient, you know what I mean? So um, a lot of, there's been a lot of investment companies, like a lot of apps, a lot of different banks, right? Yes, Robinhood. That, yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, that will allow you to invest with as little as like a dollar. Right. But where a lot of people go wrong is that they'll maybe throw in like $20 or like $100, but then they won't look at it, which isn't bad. But the best bet would be to set up something, even if it's only $5, every you know couple weeks or a month that just continuously goes into that investment account and buy stocks for you and buy stocks for you because over time those stocks pay you a dividend so they're going to be paying you a check every either three months or every six months right okay so then you might only be putting five to ten dollars in it or twenty five dollars in it over the course of a year or two the coffee yeah you have a couple hundred dollars then over the couple of years you have a couple thousand dollars and that's really that's kind of the whole premise like a 401k is you set aside some money, don't think about it, you come back when you want to retire and you have $500,000 in there. So you have a nice little comfortable nest. Yes, but starting is the hardest part, honestly, because a lot of people have that same you know, perception of investing. Yeah, like, you know, I need to have a lot of money to invest in like a Microsoft or something like that. It's really not that, not that hard. That makes it seem way less intimidating to think of it that way. Yeah. And I promise you, like... I've had my dad explain that to me. <laughs> I've had other friends explain that to me. And I, I feel like I have just like repressed that information. But I feel but I think because I'm I'm sort of like a set it and forget it kind of person too. Yeah. Where it's oh, just that'd like, be perfect for you. Like let's just you know, what what is that? Five dollars is a coffee. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Like I can do that every couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Um okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna get Robin Hood if you think that that's get the Robin good Hood. one to start yeah. with. Yeah, yeah. That's basically like you just log in. It tells you like the hot stocks or something like that. The the companies that are coming up. Obviously, you know all the companies like Amazon, Tesla, those type of companies. And you just find something that you like or that you use. Obviously, like you, Nike, things like that. Like yeah. LVMH. Those are all things you can invest in. Um, so I think it'd be good for you. And then that is me. Is that I'm gonna sound really really stupid, but is that me starting a portfolio? Is that yes. that's the that's term that we use for that? Okay, that's your investment portfolio. <laughs> And right. that can grow with you for the next four years. And believe me, if you consistently put money in there, you're, you're going to have like a substantial amount of money. Right. Yeah. Okay. I have an app called Albert um, and it sort of does like that, but without investing it, it just takes money. Is it the roundup? I don't know. If you spend like, let's say 75 cents, it like rounds it up to a dollar and then that 25 cents goes into like some type of like savings account. Something like that. Something yeah. Like that. Where they'll yeah. take, I set it, I set a percentage and, and based on the income to my one bank account, mm-hmm. it'll take out X amount each week. That's good as well. And then I'll, I'll look at that and that's always a nice surprise, mm-hmm. right? Because then I'm like, oh, cool. Like I have some funds that I can throw towards rent if I'm short a month or something like that yep. or if I feel like a little tight mm-hmm. one month to the next. So you know, I have something like that where that's cool and I appreciate that. Yeah. I don't see how it would be any different if I put that money into an investing app. It, right? would, it would be growing as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with it. I'm so, with it. so what advice would you give for a, an up and coming person who wants to break into the New York scene as either an artist, graphic designer, or someone who just wants to be around like the action in New York? Show up physically show up physically and mm-hmm. make connections and um, be true to yourself and just be not in not in uh, that cliche way, but just be yourself. Let people get to know you and build a real connection with you. Yeah. Um, and, and things will work out. Connections will become fruitful, you know, two, three years down the line where yeah. you'll be thankful you showed up to this, you know, obviously now it's different, but, you know, if you show up to that art gallery and you meet, a random artist and then you show them your Instagram, da da da, you know, um, you know, those things unfold mm-hmm. in, in unexpected ways. And and that is literally the root of any success that I've ever had, whether it be, you know, becoming a creative partner, lead graphic designer, um, you know, getting my own art off the ground, all yep. of that is literally just because I pulled up to somebody's jewelry booth one day and they believed in me because they saw I was like this like <laughs> young little like crazy kid that wanted to be on the scene you know you just put yourself there physically yeah or be in somebody's ear you know mm-hmm. keep dming them you know um put in the work keep your head down and put the work in you know i think a lot of people want fast results now and and 
I think back now, it's like, well, all right, ever since I came to New York, I've been doing art. And nobody rocked with my art until just now. Nobody cared at all about crazy. what I was doing crazy for like about. four years. And that's cool because I was doing it for other reasons, right? Um, for like self-fulfilling reasons. But, you know, keep your head down and work. That's that's definitely another piece of advice where it's like eventually somebody's going to rock with what, you, what you're doing. Mm-hmm. But put yourself there. Be be in the scene. And, you know, that does mean, unfortunately, sometimes you got to work work jobs that don't pay you enough. And, and I know that that's not a realistic... But that's... that's it's not just, realistic for everyone. That's not fair, yeah, right? Especially in New York. It's yeah, hard. Yeah, I know. Um, you know, live in a bad apartment for a few years. Just and, get a roommate. <sighs> there, and, and, yeah, I did want to talk about sacrifices because... That's something that a lot of people will never see. It's always behind the scenes. But if you don't make them at the start, you're never going to get to where you want to go. You never so like, want to talk about it either. So things, yeah. you, things you were talking about, sometimes like you might not be able to take Ubers. You might have to be on the subway where it's hot. Where or, it's hot. You're going to sweat and your makeup's going to get messed up. <laughs> but Or you, you have to what? get a roommate or like yeah. you have to get a job that you don't want to do, paying you less than your worth. Like those are all sacrifices that you have to make, I feel like, to get to the next level. And it and it's and hard. if you're really dedicated to yeah, it. Yeah, and it's hard to know when to pull the trigger and be like, Well, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna work here or I'm gonna intern and be unpaid for X amount of time and you know, when do I pull out? Like I feel like those things come down to just trusting your gut instinct Mm -hmm. and and that can be rocked very easily. And I know that, and you you know, I mean, you got to make mistakes and stuff like that, but that's the best way to learn sometimes. I know it's hard. That's hard. And and I look back on times where like I had, I had no money. I was like, I can't even do my laundry kind of thing. And, and I, and not like, that's like a sob story. Many like there are things that could be way worse than that, but you know, I had my, I had an apartment and stuff like that. And now I look back at those times where it's like, all right, like, I feel like you kind of have to do that. You yeah. kind of have to be like. Every now and again, you have to take a step back. You have to be like, okay, here's where I was. Now here's where I am. Like, that wasn't so bad. So like, you know. Let me thank myself for believing in myself and, and doing these things and, and all that. So, you know, and it builds character, you know, and it makes you humble. And Definitely. I think it's you have to, to humble yourself, yourself every now and again. Oh my God, Especially man. when you learn one of those lessons, you're like, damn, like, you know, I didn't want to go through it, but now that I did, I'm not going to make that mistake again. You know what? You, I kind of reflect on those things and reminisce on them, and, and I don't see them as being, like, necessarily absolutely negative, right? Like, it's it sucks when you're going through it, but when you can look back on those things, like not having enough money to buy a bodega sandwich or something, it's... it's um, it's not the worst, right? It's not the worst. It's not the worst to it's only just sacrifice time. those things. Yeah, it's only a point in time. Yeah. So who are your, some of your mentors? That's that's what I want to know because I feel like you're you're very driven, you're very passionate about what you do. So I want to know who like uh, influences you. And this could be what you're doing now or what you were doing before. You know, just coming up in in the whole art space. Um. You know, Greg is uh, my mentor in a lot of ways as. Uh, creative Mm -hmm. as a creative and as a just his the way that he moves is that he is dedicated to putting his group and his people on definitely that's what he did for me definitely it took in like you know i wasn't making work that he loved for a really long time but once i did he was like cool we're gonna get you in the room with the right people i'm gonna connect you with this that the fourth all that so he's you know a mentor to me in in that aspect of knowing how to move around your people and for your people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, like, you know, I I learn about how, you know, he has a good soul and everything. Like, he really wants to see his friends win and all that stuff. And and seeing him lead by example in that way is is mentorship to me. Yeah, I view that as mentorship. And, you know, just having a good heart and, you know, also as a a creative, you know, breaking the rules, bending the rules, going left when they go right. Mm -hmm. He's a mentor to me in that way. Liz is also a mentor to me. I've been with her for over two and a half years. And um, she has made, like, she has shown me how to move in an industry as a woman. Yeah. You know? Um, and she she's way more, you know, she's able to talk about money in a way better way than I am. And she's confident. She's a businesswoman. Yeah. She really is. She's a fine artist. Um, but I'm I'm watching her. And, and she's 
teaching me these things and she's helping me uh, figure out how to operate in this space. Even mm -hmm. though, you know, we make really different art and I'm a graphic designer for her, which I view as a service job ultimately. Yeah. I'm not giving creative input necessarily. Um, you know, sh that, you know, she has showed me how to get deals, make negotiations. So she's a mentor in that aspect. And then, you know, I, I also reflect on my parents. Yeah. My parents never wanted, like, you know what I mean? My parents have office jobs. They've had office jobs. You know, they weren't necessarily excited to go to work every day, but I saw them get up every morning and go. And they were just relentless. Like, they just did it. And I appreciate them for that. So, you know, it might be a little bit of an obvious answer, but my parents definitely were mentors to me by just showing up and, and leading by example in that way. Yeah. Yeah. You That's know? Dope. I appreciate them for that. Mm -hmm. And, you know. Sometimes it's, it's often overlooked, right? Just to see your parents, like you said, just get up every day and work and work and, and provide. And at the time, you, you might be thinking, like, I don't have everything my friends have or, you know, like, I don't have everything that I want. But you have to think about, like, if you were in that position, it, it, it's hindsight is twenty twenty, But, like, that's yeah. a lot of, you know, dedication and work. And you kind of take those things for granted sometimes. I certainly did. I certainly did. And I gave my parents grief for it. I, I made I am sure that I hurt my parents feelings at some point when I was in high school where I was like. I don't really want to have friends over. We have like a smaller house than all my friends. There's not much room to do anything. Like that's, you know, I look back at that where it's like, damn, like, you know, they they worked so hard for all these amazing. And I had a charmed childhood. It was yeah. great, right? I always had food on my on the table and there's a roof over my head and everything was great. And it doesn't. And I feel like it's until you need to provide for yourself exclusively and solely. Do you really understand? how much of a sacrifice that is, how much work that is, you know? It's it's crazy to think about, especially, I and I think it's even more important to be out here in New York doing what you're doing or, or doing what we're doing. Like, it's, it's not cheap. And like you said, once you get into that position where you actually do have to start providing for yourself, you really learn, I, I think, the value of a dollar. And you really start to think about money in a different sense. Like, right now, I couldn't imagine taking care of myself, a spouse, mm -mm. and a kid. Mm-mm. That, that, those, those are just things right now, like, I just, I can't imagine doing it, let alone, you know, being able to to do that on, like, a, you know, a lower salary or something like that. So those oh are all God, factors yeah. that, that go into it. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that's a conversation I, I should have with my parents, you know, because I do appreciate that. And I also think that they can bestow some financial wisdom to, on me, you know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? They did it right. That's that's what I'm getting. Or they did it where they they dedicated their whole lives to just providing for us, right? Yeah. And they did it thoughtfully, and they were decisive about it. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think I'm ready to have conversations like that with them, where I can guarantee you, like, if they saw the way I spend my money now, they would be horrified, <laughs> right? Because they don't. Also, the cost of living in Ohio is far different than oh, it is yeah. in New York, definitely. Which is something that changes things up a lot. Mm -hmm to um you know the what i pay for rent you couldn't find i don't even know if you could find an apartment in toledo right you know yeah. that i mean I, I guess obviously you could but like you know it's not the standard it would be a right? house like a home yeah rather than like with a backyard and all these things so you know it's it's just at a different scale and that that changes a lot of things too um you know where like a large percentage of my income just goes to rent you know, same over fifty percent. You. Yeah. you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, and you're from Ohio too, mm -hmm. right? Columbus, Columbus, Ohio. So, you know, Columbus is yeah. I mean, about the same. Honestly. Midwest, yeah. I Midwest would say vibes. Yeah. Columbus <laughs> is like a, a little bit bigger and cooler, but um, <laughs> yeah, I would say the Midwest cost of living is cheap, and you know, cheap, cheap it is it as it is. I feel like it, it's. It's impossible for me to not be in New York at this point, though. Yeah, definitely. I'll be honest. And, you know, I'm sure you feel the same way. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I do want to ask this question. Going forward, um, if you were to have a family, have kids, what would you talk to them about in terms of money or finances? Hmm. Or would you have those conversations? Hmm. I'll tell you this. I would give my kids an allowance. Really? Yeah, I didn't have an allowance. I never, like, my parents, it wasn't a thing. Um, and I think that that would have made me more comfortable handling money. Mm -hmm. um, I never thought about it that way. Because that when sense. I when I didn't have an allowance and then I, for like a birthday or Christmas, had magically like 
fifty dollars in my pocket. It was burning a hole in my pocket because I was so excited. You just wanted it. to spend it. I didn't know you how to, to manage find the it. fastest way to spend it. Yeah. yeah, and I would blow it all the time on stupid things, and I think that that would play a role in it. And I think, <laughs> you know, if I were to have a family anytime soon, which I'm not planning on, yeah. You know, I would talk to my kids about, you know, hopefully I would instill some more patience and thoughtfulness in my kids about those things. Mm -hmm. Because while finances are not ruining my life by any means at this point, they're not making it any easier. So, and I feel like, you know, you're in a position where finance is a part of your life and you've made it work for you. And I'm not able to do that yet. Because I haven't fully faced it. But I would have my kids, you know, start managing money and, and teach them how to, you know, make things work to their in their favor. Absolutely. And a little bit better, um, you know, save some money, you know, just know how to handle it on a small <laughs> scale. Yeah. I think that I, that I feel like that's, I, um, I've never heard about that. But now that you say it, it makes complete sense. Like giving your kid an allowance and then kind of guiding them in the way to spend it instead of like you said like I, it happens with me like if I was a kid and I got a bunch of money I wanted to go buy a video game or, or something like that and I think about all the money that I just went through and it made it makes no sense now but now I can kind of look back and say you know, it's because I didn't have that you know guidance or that th- same type of you know so you like your parents didn't give you that sort of like it wasn't until i want to say high school that my dad actually started to tell me about like stocks okay and stuff like that and how you can i think i opened up an investment account in high school or something like that but it wasn't it wasn't really me like actually being on it it was just oh i have an investment account i can buy like nike or something like that but you were ahead of the game i was ahead of the game so i will say that i was ahead of the game you got your foot in the door with that and And that is cool that your dad did that yeah (laughs) and it was one of those things where like then my uncle would be like hey like whenever you do start making money, save 10%. And sounds so easy, but it's so hard. When when you actually think about it, especially being a kid, it's like, oh, yeah, just save 10%, but, like, saving it for what? Right. You know, is it, should, am I saving it to invest, saving it to, like... I don't have a tangible thing to put this towards or anything exactly, like that. And exactly. So, so getting into the kind of the habit of saving money for things like rent or an emergency fund or... You know, if I want to move to New York, you know, being able to just up and move and, you know, having that financial cushion, those are all things that I kind of just had to learn along the way, honestly. Did you, and did you do that throughout college? Did that throughout college. Like, I want to say when I was in college, I, I bought an investment property. Like, that's when it really started to heat up for me. And I was like, there's so many different things out there that I never knew about either savings, investing, buying real estate, investing with friends. Like, those are all things that I started doing really, like, in, in college. And honestly, I, I'm blessed to say, like, I'm happy I did that because now I'm at the point where all those things, like five years ago when I was doing it, I really didn't think about it that much. But now that you're at the point where it's like, they've been investing and maturing and bringing me income for years upon years. Like now it's, it's really starting to pay off. You, you don't see it at first though, honestly. Yeah. Present takes, you is thinking past you big exactly. time, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. And, and I think that that is so admirable and like, that it's coveted, right? That yeah. sort of just the experience with it, I think, um, helps it helps you to navigate those things. You've been doing it for what five years now? Yeah, five That's years. It's a long time. Yeah, you and, know, and which is one of the reasons why I started this because I'm like, I would always try to help my friends out in the past with different not like things that I've learned along the way, but now it's like I can have a platform to kind of get that out. Right. And talk to people and see their experiences because, like, without having this conversation, I would have never known those things about you. You would have probably never know, known the, some of the things about me. So having those conversations, and I know people can relate on both sides. Certainly. To get better. I pray I'm not the only one that's going No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. No, but it does feel better to know that there are other people that uh, maybe feel the same way. Or maybe yeah, abso- I feel like, absolutely. I, feel like um, I could be an extreme example just because I am so... Um, unwilling to face it mm-hmm. but whatever that's starting now right <laughs> believe me you're not i've asked people to come on the show and they've declined because they don't want to talk about money yeah. in public i thought about that yeah. i did yeah. because it's it's whatever like and and i also was talking to my boyfriend about this earlier today i was like well it's just one thing that i'm not 
super elite at. I'm yeah. just not good at it, and I can't allow myself to have shame about that or feel bad about that anymore. I just need to change it if I really want to change it. You exactly. know exactly. And being an athlete, probably anything that came you know your way in the past, like you're so competitive, you want to master it, and if you can't master it, you get angry. So I think that's where like for a lot of uh, former athletes, that's that's where it comes in as well. Like it's like. I don't know if I'll be good at it and I don't want to take the time to actually build that master. And that definitely crosses over to other artists as well. A mm-hmm. hundred, that competitive nature where it's like, well, I see this artist doing this and I'm happy for them and I'm excited for them. But I also reflect and compare yeah. with myself and I'm like, well, you know, how did they get that? Do they have an investor? Should I be looking for an investor? Exactly, yeah. Do they have a manager? Can I get a manager like that? Mm-hmm. You know, can I get this collaboration, this feature, this press write up? Let's go, let's go, yeah. let's go. And it's, it's all about having those conversations, though. And then it because becomes sometimes, overwhelming. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes you compare too much and you're like, they might have this situation or that or what if like that. But sometimes it's just a matter of, hey, you know what? Like having that open conversation like we're having right now about finances and finding the actual route. And then that maybe, you know, could spark something in there. Absolutely. I think um, I think a lot of people probably are really good at making it seem like they have it together, too. Absolutely. And that's cool and i get it and i respect the facade but and i it happens a lot in new york of course of yeah. course i feel like we're at the center of that <laughs> which is fine every nobody has as much money as you think they have but um you know i think it's cool that you're doing this so we can say listen i'm f- falling i'm free falling right now mm-hmm. I, I gotta get a grip on things and it's it's ultimately not that scary right yeah it's really not. You're making it. You're making it. We'll figure it out as we go, right? This um, is another thing. Yeah. I'm going to just, just another thing fail upwards. Gonna, exactly. You're going to look back and you're going to say, you know what? Having that conversation made me better. Or it helped somebody else that was in the same position as me. You know? Sure. Exactly. And like, whatever. Hopefully I stay on top of my taxes this year. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, I make some investments and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just to wrap it up, I want to say thank you for coming on the show. Um, it's been amazing. I learned a lot about you. I hope hopefully a lot of people did as well, but I do want to give you a chance to, um, talk about some of your social media, some of the projects you have coming up as well, just so people can know exactly who you are and what you have to offer as well. All right. So, um, I offer prints right now. I make prints out of, uh, jewelry and, or I make digital designs out of jewelry and Mm -hmm. photographs. Um, so I have prints for sale right now and I'm working on getting a deal for home goods and getting some, you know, some different types of art yeah. for the home. So that'll be coming in the near future, but I don't have anything uh, solid to plug for that right now. What's your? Uh, so I know you have a website, right? I have a, a website. It's just rachelgoatley.com. And Instagram? Rachel Goatley. So if you guys want to check her out, she has a lot of dope pieces on there. I'd highly recommend. Rachel, thank you for being on the show. And it was Money Talks Podcast. Thank you so much.